morning. I'm very nervous, um, so let's just start off there. Um, sorry. So 13 years ago, when I joined Kalakshetra, one of the first things that I was told was that I spoke too fast. And I think that the first Tamil sentence that I actually understood was, Ava, inna shona? You know, my teachers kept asking, what is he saying, what is he saying, because I spoke even faster than I am right now. So for me, language and dance have always been quite difficult. They're not something that have been as easy as they are for other people. So when Apurva asked me to talk at Navadisha, I, about, <laughs> when she asked me to talk about language and Abhinayam, I a, thought she was joking, and I really hoped that my presentation would be about Jadi Swarams or something like that. Alas, here I am. So what I, uh, so for me, Abhinayam is not that easy. It's actually a very, very, very difficult thing. Adavas are simple. You jump around, you feel like you've jumped around, and you, there's a method to the madness. Whereas with Abhinayam, it really, really is a struggle, and it's, I'm not saying that just because I'm here. I, it's something that I really do feel. There's so many things for us to think of simultaneously. We're talking about language. We're talking about movements. Then there's angles and characterization. And my newfound absolute hatred is walking. I prefer to just stay stationary when I do a padam because then it's like one less thing to contend with. But poor Braga teacher, she deals with me as best as she can. Um, but I also, I think, while I was thinking about this talk, realized that I'm probably not alone in feeling very taken back when it comes to learning new padams, new javalis. For me, each one is like a Mount Everest. You know, when we sit in class, it takes me a good 10 minutes to settle down. Then we start the padam, and it's like this slow mountain. Because that's what padams and javalis are. They are little mountains. And they get, there's harder ones, there's, for me, a little bit easier ones. They're just a little bit smaller than Everest. But, um, so, sorry. I've, like, jumped around on my page. Now I don't know where I am. Um, so, So language, when we think, I think when we think of English that as a language that we commonly associate with dance for obvious reasons, something that I have been pushed by my teacher to do is use Tamar as the dialogue inside my head, which is a very, very, very confusing thing when you're born in Australia and your mother tongue is actually English. So the sentences in my head are probably not fully formed. They're not even half formed. They're just the same six or seven words pushed back and forward, ni inge, na inge. It's, it's, it's a mess. But it is what it is. And I do do a large percentage of my inner dialogues in Tamar. So one thing that Apurva and I were talking about was I've done the, I've learned the Javali, Oh My Lovely Lalana, which is an English, a partially English Javali. And I remember that when I was learning it, Braga teacher said to me, Inada. It's your language. I said, Ama teacher, Ana. I, I that's like, what you have to remember when you're thinking about language is that it belongs to someone. I talk in it. I talk in circles around myself because I believe that there is some benefit in speaking Tamil. There is something you will get out of it. Every day, you can ask Sudarshini. I call her and she doesn't understand what I'm saying, but I will still speak because, God damn it, I have to. So, while, um, so then, Oh My Lovely luckily went off without a hitch because Akka sings it beautifully. Do you want me to get her to sing it? I can. Akka, please. Because mm. I've not practiced, please. Akka, it's as if this isn't bad enough. Ayoyo, I don't even remember the hands. Oh, my lovely Lalana, Elene Pomanti, oh, my lovely Lalana. Yeah, 
And though it works and though it's funny, one question arised in my mind. Is it funny because the piece is intrinsically funny? Or is it because it's in English? I think it's a valid question. What, what makes it funny? I hope, well, just then it was the dancing. But is it the poetry? Are we looking at, at, are we looking at it as a serious poetry? Or are we looking at it as a, a fun piece? So, so when you contextualize, when you're contextualizing ideas, what do we have to take into consideration? One of the poems that I will be using today is Poor Girl, which is a poem by Maya Angelou. I'll read out the poem for you now. Okay. Mm -hmm. You've got another love, and I know it. Someone who adores you, just like me. Hanging on your words like they were gold. Thinking that she understands your soul. Poor girl, just like me. breaking another heart and I know it and there's nothing I can do if I try to tell her what I know she'll misunderstand and make me go poor girl just like me you're going to leave her too and I know it She'll never know what made you go. She'll cry and wonder what went wrong. Then she'll begin to sing this song, Poor Girl, Just Like Me. So I remember the first time I read this poem and I just looked at my friend and said, it sounds like a padam, like it sounds exactly like a padam. There's nothing in this that isn't something that we could do in Bharatanatyam. I was so, so wrong. <laughs> what, uh, the things that I would just like to point out that I found interesting when exploring this poem was this, the way that the Naika looks at the other woman. <laughs> Oh, 
so an idea that I put into this piece was something that I'm not sure a lot of people here might understand, but it's a very common disturbing pickup line that happens to some of us when we go out to bars is men use this line, it's really cheesy, they'll come up to you and go, did it hurt? And you kind of go, did what hurt? And you'll be like, they're like, did it hurt when you fell down from heaven because you're just so beautiful? It's, it's, dis it's really, really bad. It, it, but that's the kind of character that I imagine this guy saying. So instead of saying, oh, you're beautiful like a jasmine flower, or, oh, you know, your eyes are long like lotus stems, no one says that outside of India. So to me, using that, using it, 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 to me, it might not be correct, but it works. The idea translates. That's what I was talking about when I'm trying to use content that comes from an outside perspective in dance. Um, so another piece, the last piece that we, I explored was a poem, or sorry, a poem called In and Out of Time by Maya Angelou. The sun has come. The mist has gone. We see in the distance our long way home. I was always yours to have. You are always mine. We have loved each other in and out of time. When the first stone looked up at the blazing sun and the first tree struggled up from the forest floor, I had always loved you more. You freed my braids, gave your hair to the breeze. It hummed like a hive of honeybees. I reached into the mass of your sweet honeycomb bear. Mm. God, how I love your hair. You saw me bludgeoned by circumstance, lost, injured, hurt by chance. I screamed to the heavens loudly screamed, trying to change our nightmares into dreams. The sun has come, the mist has gone, we see in the distance our long way home. I was always yours to have, you are always mine. We have loved each other, in and out, in and out, in and out of time. Sorry. Um, one thing that really stood out to me in this poem, obviously, is that it, it somehow mirrors each of us. I think everyone that I've sent it to going, what do you think about this piece, gets something else out of it. It's very gender neutral in its content. So it's not written, I, I feel like it's not written from a particular perspective, which is really, really interesting because our poetry generally has gendered pronouns. Um, it, it's one of the things that really made me read it again and again, and it was just so interesting. I mean, the first line is so simple. The sun has come, the mist is gone. We've seen the distance our long way home. I was always yours to have, you were always mine. We have loved each other in and out of time. It's beautiful at that level. It's beautiful to just think of like that. But the more that I read it, the more that I explored it, the more I realized how many metaphors there were inside of such a small line and the capacity that was there. I also realized that it's funny because we were talking about it yesterday in rehearsal. Sudarshini felt like it was a, a, a relationship that had finished, a relationship that had gone the distance and had kind of gotten there, right? Like there was an experience there, whereas I saw it as a new relationship that was at the starting. I think one of the things that's so beautiful about Maya Angelou's poetry, it is what you make of it. It's not so decided for you like a lot of what we have. A lot of us have, you know, this padam is done in this way, and it is that, and it's sacrosanct. Whereas here, we have the ability to explore. 
So this is, I, I feel like it's, I, w after we talked about it yesterday, I realized that love traverses time. It really doesn't, time becomes completely irrelevant. And for those of you who have been so lucky to fall in love, you know that when, you know when you first meet someone and time just becomes the most irrelevant thing ever. If you're a millennial like me, it means texting till four o'clock in the morning. But I think all of us do that. I think it's a thing where we're so in love and it's that what I see in this Padam is, or this, see I refer to it as a Padam because in my head this is already like there. Well, it's not there, but anyway. Um, it's just that it, it's got so much potential. Like when you meet someone for the first time, within that first couple of days, you want to tell them everything. I was, I, a very, well, I thought it was very smart, was that every SMS beep becomes like a butterfly in your tummy and suddenly your whole world turns into padri vargade. It's very like, you know, like, ooh, a message. And, and that's what this piece feels like to me is that they're at the start of this relationship. Whoever the main person that's speaking has loved this person for a very, very long time. And it might not have been requainted. Is that the right word? Yeah. No? Requited. Sorry. See, I, I try to speak so much somewhere in my head that I've forgotten English. Um, but it's that kind of a love. It's a love that traverses everything. And, and I know I said that word wrong too. Um, but there's so many beautiful metaphors in there. So when I was setting the piece, I realized that the only way to explain a metaphor is to use another metaphor. So for the sun is rising, the mist is gone. I, I believe what is being discussed is the realization that the sun has risen. So Darshini also was telling me in Tamar, there's, what's that thing? Do you want to explain that? Or if, if apparently in, in, in Tamar, it's a thing where you say the sun has come and people understand that that means that things have started. In English, I don't believe we say that to people. I've never heard anyone come to me and say, the sun has come, and I go, oh, okay, cool. So for me, so, so something that was very obvious for Sudarshini was completely like that for me. But that, so the sun has come is that the relationship has finally started. Everything that she dreamt of, or he has dreamt of, or they have dreamt of, has finally come to fruition. So with the rising of the sun, I imagine that, you know, they've, they've sat together discussing everything. Their past, their future, everything has been discussed in this one incident. And when they wake up, they wake up to the sun rising. But then how, how do you make that clear? So what I've done is try to use ideas such as flowers blooming, but not in the way that we generally use it, but as a metaphor for the relationship beginning or opening or growing, that the sound of the birds chirping is the sound of the talk that we had, that, you know, have you seen in the morning when there's that one bird that kind of flies over to the other bird and then they kind of sit there together? It's like them, that that is a simile for their relationship. And then I thought of something else that you really do hear when you live in Chennai, is the sound of prayer. You wake up early in the morning, you can hear all kinds of sounds, especially if you wake up in Mylapore, you hear a lot. So that, that sound for me really symbolized thanks. Um, we see in our distance the long way home, to me was a, a much more of a metaphor that be as I saw it as a young couple who are starting out, there's so many things that we have to traverse to get to that point. We're here. I can see that, I can see that this relationship is going to go the distance. I don't have a doubt in my mind that it's going to work. But to get to that point, we're going to have to go through hurdles. And we're going to have to do it together, and we will. But it's, it's going to be a journey to get there. The last thing that I found really, really profound was we have loved each other in and out of time. It is by far one of the most beautiful lines of poetry I've read in a long time, just for its simplicity. But then when you come to putting a gesture for it, how do you do it? It's such 
a beautiful metaphor. I came up with one that took me quite a while, which was using hamsasio gestures to show in and out and time as a, as a line, as we do. Sudarshini was telling me yesterday, because Sudarshini is most of my brain, was telling me yesterday that kalatil is a never, it's a never ending word. It's kind of ongoing. So when you bring your hand down at that time, there's a definition of end, whereas this is ongoing. So we've talked about it yesterday. I will do that, and then I promise I will stop talking. Um, yeah, in and out of time. We're just doing the, uh, the sun has come, the mist has gone part. Bandh bitta 
चाह थैंक यू वेरी मच क्रिस्टफर थैंक यू श्रीमती नंदिनी एंड सुदर्शनी